Well, welcome to another edition of Test Me Time with me, Doug Harris. And Test Me Time is the program where we see what God has done in somebody's life, taking them from where they were to where he wants them to be. And today that testimony is going to be given by Andrew Goodwin. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, fascinating story. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I know it already, of course. Um, and I think I want to unpack it for people. But let, let's start quite a young age. You begin to have, well, I suppose what were frightening fantasy experiences. Yeah. Be begin to talk us through what happened at that time. Yeah, well, um, the first thing I can remember that was a, a strange, weird experience was um, I was about four years old and um, my mum had asked me to go and get ready for bed. Um, so I came round to the bottom of the stairs um, and, I, and, I, and I looked up to the top of the stairs uh, and I saw a figure at the top of the stairs and there was this um, green figure of a guy about four foot tall had um, yellow eyes and, and looked at me with this really like evil, sadistic look. And, 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 and I stood there just shocked in fear for what seemed like a really long time. It was probably only a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And I went running to my mum, mummy, mummy, there's a monster at the top of the stairs. You know, and um, she's like, no, no, you're all right, there isn't. And she took me upstairs, took me into bed. Um, but I was still aware I was, I mean, I was shook up, I was scared. Um, I mean, people say, oh, when you're here as a child, oh, there's no such thing as monsters and stuff like that. But I'd really seen something, it really freaked me out. And, you know, she looked under the bed, looked in the cupboard, no monsters there. And she took me into, took me into bed and, and left me there. And um, we lived in that house for another year and a half after that. And I remember when I would go to bed, I, I would very often, um, feel like a presence. You, did, you didn't see uh, uh, this figure again. I never saw it again. But you sensed something was there. Yeah, it was almost like uh, seeing it stuck with me yeah. Yeah. and the sense of fear that I had. And, and my, uh, I had a, a younger sister, she was only a year old, and there were things going through my head like, oh, what's, what about my little sister? You know, I wanted to protect her if I could. Mm -hmm. um, and we moved house about a year and a half afterwards and thankfully when we moved the the sort of uh, yeah it did kind of come to an end at that point yeah it really shook me up and i i suppose something like that stays with you uh, while, while you're growing up yeah and I, I suppose do you lack confidence then at times i mean how, how did that affect your I think, development i think i think definitely because sometimes when we experience things that are bad and we can't explain them on some level they they have a, a continuing effect on us and um, I think definitely after that, it affected my childhood, affected me growing up. Um, and it did affect my confidence. I wouldn't necessarily have known it at the time, but yeah, it, it was back, because of that, it. definitely, yeah. Let's move on, because all of these things are gonna to come together, but let's move on to okay. 10 years of age. Yeah. Um, and a traumatic experience at that yeah. point. Well, um, when, I was, when I was 10, um, I, I was staying with a friend of the family, which I'd often do, they, they were really close. And um, I was staying there and there was, there was an older guy there who, uh, he was about four years older than me and we were quite close, we spent a lot of time playing computer games and stuff like that. Well anyway, there was an incident that happened where I got sexually abused um, and I found it really difficult and during the time where it was happening, you know, I was conscious of what was going on in the room with him, but at the same time, I could, I, I could hear audible cackling voices laughing at me. Um, and so there was some sort of audio hallucinations going on and it scared me, it scared me. It was almost like the same thing happening all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that caused, I couldn't look at my friend's um, parents. I couldn't look at them and it, and it in, and I never told anybody about it, you know, for a what, long, long time. Why, why was that? What, was that fear? Was that shame? Uh, do, you, do you know why you couldn't share it? Because, I mean, yeah, I mean one yeah. of the things we're told, and, and we tell young people is if something like that happens, make sure you go and share it. But many seem to say the same thing as you. I couldn't. 
Well, I think it comes down to, um, there, were th there were things, I mean, obviously I was really young, but um, going back to when I saw the monster the first time, there were, there were things that were almost spoken to me on a subconscious level. I remember having strange dreams, strange uh, hallucinations, and I remember that it was almost like uh, the devil had spoken into my life, you can't trust people, you can't trust your family, they can't look after you, they mm -hmm. can't protect you. So, and, and I, I had no reason not to believe that. So the, these things that had happened caused me to be, uh, to, to, to draw back from trust. I didn't trust anybody. And, and in the, the loneliness and the pain of it all, you know, I, I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't trust anybody. I couldn't go to my parents. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, I would have gone to my parents, yes. but there was, that trust just wasn't there. Yes, yes. I was all alone. As far as I was concerned, the, life was a very lonely place. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was no one to turn mm -hmm. to. I mean, that was bad enough, but if anything, things were going to get worse for you. Definitely. Because as, as you get into your mid-teens and late teens, I mean, in, in, in the end, you're diagnosed with schizophrenia. But yeah. I mean, tell us how, how that came about, what experiences you were having, how you felt. I, I know as we look on to people with schizophrenia, I mean, some people think it's a bit of a joke that you've got different, I mean, it obviously is not. It's serious. How did you feel and what did you feel like when you were finally diagnosed? It was very difficult when I got diagnosed and obviously there was a whole series of events that ran up to it. Um, I think by the time that I got diagnosed, I still didn't believe it. I didn't believe that I was ill because I thought I was right. You know, I had a very um, twisted view of reality. Mm. You know, I was very damaged. But by the time I got diagnosed, I'd obviously been ill for quite a while, but nobody really noticed. Um, I mean, from the age of 13, I started smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 15, I was doing it every day. So it was almost like an escape. And I never had friends long enough for them to get to know me really well. Um, but when eventually I, I had a, a breakdown, um, and because um, it was my dad, he realized that I'd got a problem. And both my parents have worked most of their lives in mental health, excuse me. And they, uh, my dad realized I had a problem one time when he came back from work and I was sat in the living room, staring at the TV, pointing at it, trying to use like telepathic powers to uh, manipulate things that were going on on TV. Because mm. one, one, one of the funny things about mental illness and people with schizophrenia can probably relate to it, that, that there's this sort of sense that you're connected in a deeper way with a lot of things that are going on. You know, for me, I, I, I had the TV, um, you know, I, w I wouldn't just sit and watch TV like normal people and find it entertaining. It was almost like there was a direct relationship between my life and what was going on on the TV. But that to you, as you see, as you say, your dad comes in and immediately yeah. sees there's something wrong. But to you, that, that was reality. Absolutely. Yeah. But at the same time, reality didn't make sense. Yes. So I knew that there was loads of this stuff going on around me that was real, but it was like a jigsaw that was all jumbled up. It didn't make sense. So when I get told, when I get a diagnosis that I'm uh, paranoid schizophrenic, to me, that was just another part of the messed up puzzle. And it didn't make sense. It took me a while to be able to actually accept it. Mm -hmm. um, and I lost a, a lot of friends. And, and I think I also lost any hope that I had in my life that actually my life could amount to anything, you know. So, so here is a teenager who should be looking forward to life. I mean, to you, no future? No. When I was 17, they told me that I'd never be employable. I'd never drive. Um, I'd be on medication for the rest of my life. Um, you know, and, and that was it. And, you know, I, I, already, I was already damaged. I was already pretty homeless, uh, hopeless. Mm -hmm. And they, they tell me this, and it's just like, everything, just, everything that I had that, that I actually liked, I just, just came crashing down. And it, it sent me into worse depression. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to tell my friends. I didn't want to, and that actually 
caused my drug taking to get worse. You know, and it caused me to so want to run away even you more. You were on medication, but you were also taking illegal drugs as well. Yeah, so yeah, tenuous. yeah, yeah. All kinds of different drugs. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and did any of this help? Medication-wise? Yes. Um, I think it did to, it did, it did to a great degree sometimes. Um, I think it slowed my mind down a bit. Right. But it also caused me to put weight on. Yeah. Um, and it didn't help me to have any hope. It just helped me to uh, not have to struggle as much, but it, it didn't take anything away. And it didn't, I didn't find myself actually able to cope. Mm -hmm. I wasn't coping very well at all. Mm -hmm. Pretty depressing. Um, what, what was it like getting out of bed every day? I, I mean, how do you face a day? I, I, the reason I'm asking is I'm sure there are people watching that can relate to yeah. where you were. Yeah. Praise God you're not there now, Amen. but you, that's where Amen. you were. I mean, what, what, what did it feel like day by day and how did you motivate yourself to move one foot in front of the other? Life just seemed to be like this horrible cycle. I used to, I used to go through times of not wanting to sleep because I'd have nightmares. Um, you know, I think there were times when I considered suicide, but the, the, the reason why I didn't was because I thought, well, I don't want to let my family down. It was really hard. It was really hard. I don't, I, I, guess, it, I guess being on drugs and I was like, well, you know, I'm going to be able to get stoned and, and that's about it. There wasn't anything that really kept me going, mm -hmm. to be honest. I didn't feel like I had anything to live for and life was, life was hard. And at the same time, I was an individual who felt nobody understood and I felt alone and isolated and completely hopeless and just desperate. Mm. Um, and I did have, from time to time, people that would talk to me and, and I'd feel like, oh, you know, got some sort of sense of th this is a good friendship and stuff like that. But I mean, I'd have days where I wouldn't get out of bed. Mm. I'd have days when I'd just cry for no reason, you know, um, because I just felt so desperate. I didn't know what to do. Mm. Um, and the weight of that was so heavy. Yeah. Okay, that's, that, that's the picture. You're obviously very different now. Oh, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Now, tell us, what happened? I mean, we know because the programme we're on, it's going to be Christ that changed your life. Amen. But how, how did that come out? How did he start yeah. breaking into your life from this hopeless state, hopeless yeah. mess that you're in, to begin to change you? How did that happen? Well, it's funny because looking back, I could see that God was at work even when I was 13, when I was 17. There were things that happened, but it, it kind of just went straight over my head. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the main thing, the sort of the, what began to change the, my life was um, when I was um, 20. I was walking through uh, my town, my hometown of Retford. And I was going to look for discarded cigarette ends because I had no money and yeah, it was pretty yeah. depressing. And um, uh, through a mutual friend, a mutual friend introduced me to a guy who was um, in his first year at Bible college. And he, 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 he started asking me questions about myself. I told him, well, you know, this is me, I'm schizophrenic and depressed and all that. And he started telling me about Jesus. Um, and it's a funny thing because I consider my, myself to be someone who'd always believed that there was more to life. There was a, another reality. But I think the search for that truth and knowing had just left me even more crazy because I just kind of came to the conclusion, you can't know the truth. Mm. It's just too, too complicated. But when he started to talk to me about Jesus, you know, I don't remember the words that he said. I know that I didn't understand it. But in my heart, I knew what he was saying was right. And I don't know how. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I knew, but I knew what he was saying was right. You know, he told me that, that it was, um, I had, because of my sin, because of my lifestyle, you know, God's plan for my life was, was much greater um, and that God had a plan for me and that God could rescue me. And it just seemed like too good to be true. I, you know, I believed it, but I couldn't believe it. And he, uh, he turned around and asked me if he, if he could pray for me. And it was a Thursday afternoon in a market town, people hustle and bustle yeah. walking past, took me around the corner. 
started praying, asking God to heal me of schizophrenia. And when he started praying, this, the most amazing thing happened. I felt this, this power come upon me. And, and before I knew it, I'd got my eyes closed and my hands were out like yeah. this. And I was, I was sort of inwardly focusing on, it was like heaven had dropped down, was resting in my hands. And I felt inside me, it was like everything had suddenly changed. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt this power, this love, and it was more powerful and more greater than anything I'd ever experienced in my life. You know, forget the highs of drugs. You know, this was real. This mm -hmm. was life changing and it was amazing. I felt this love, I felt this peace, I felt this joy. Um, and, and it was amazing because all I'd ever felt on the inside was loneliness, was darkness, was isolation, was evil. Some of the things I felt on the inside, you know, because bearing in mind I, had, I, I was having voices, yes. I was having hallucinations, you know, I was in turmoil and it was suddenly like the, car, the, the storm, which was a turmoil of a storm, had been stilled and suddenly I had clarity. And he was praying for me, and I don't really know what he was praying. But when he finished praying for me, I opened my eyes, and he said to me, he said, Andrew, I can just see the Holy Spirit's all over you. Do you want to give your life to Jesus? And I knew, I knew then that that's what I needed to do. I needed to give my life to Jesus, um, because all the questions that I'd ever had, all the things that I, that I, I wished I'd known, in an instance, I'd felt this peace that just took away everything. Um, yeah, so then, and th right then and there, um, I asked the Lord to, to, to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, and to give me the life that he'd created me to live, yeah. and not just the life, the mess that I'd made mm -hmm. of it. And mm -hmm. that was the beginning. That, that, that was the beginning. Tremendous experience, giving your life to Christ, new hope, etc. Yeah. All your problems solved overnight. <laughs> Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk, talk us through it, because I think sometimes people that come from your experience, are, they're, they're looking for, for the quick fix. And yeah. there was no question from what you've said. You knew God met you that day. Absolutely. But everything wasn't solved, was it? Talk no. us through those early days mm. as a Christian. Well, I think that, um, I mean, I'm really grateful to the guy that uh, introduced me to Jesus on the street that day. Um, he spent a lot of time with me. Um, and without him, I, I, I might not be here. I think that God uses people, you know, to disciple, to spend time, to love, to care and to share. You know, um, you know, he took me to a lot of places. He knew that I, I needed help. Um, yeah, I think that obviously when you give your life to Jesus, it's not a, a quick fix solution because you've had so many problems for so many years. Mm. It's a bit like something that's got so twisted up and so messed up that to get it unraveled, it's a process and it's a journey. You know, it, it took me like 20 years to get that messed up. It wasn't going to happen overnight. Um, and I think that, you know, Jesus said, if you're my disciple, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So, okay, I knew that, that God was real, that God, that God loved me, but at the same time, I was still schizophrenic, you know. And in fact, I went through a period of time for about six months where I didn't see my friend. And actually, things got a lot worse before mm. they got better. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd see, uh, when I looked at myself in the mirror, it was almost like, uh, like there were demons uh, you know, really, really trying to freak me out. And because I felt alone, it was really difficult. I mean, I had a Bible, I went to church and they, they gave me a Bible. I only went twice in the first six months of being a Christian. Um, and they gave me a Bible and I, and I tried to read the Bible. And when I pick it up, I get voices screaming in my head and I just, and I involuntarily chucked my Bible. But in that, you know, um, God was still reaching out to me. I remember just opening the Bible one time and um, I, I think it was in Romans or whatever, it doesn't really matter, but God drew my eyes to a, to a, to a word and, and every other word on that page became like a fuzzy blur, mm -hmm. but that word stood out like it was the only word on that piece of paper and it just said trust. Mm. You know, and that's, that's, that's one of the brilliant things and the wonderful things about God is he sees us in our situation and he's able to, to, 
to speak to us, no matter how messed up we might be, no matter where we are, no matter what our troubles are, God is able to speak to us through those. And God gave me that word to trust and, and I didn't let go of it. And I, I kind of felt, even though I'm in turmoil, I'm gonna believe that God is gonna heal me. He's gonna bring me through it. And it came to the, after, after that six months time went past, I found my friend Paul again and, and I, I, it was really cool. I saw him walking across the town and he was glowing. He was shining like an angel and obviously nobody else could see him like that. But to me, it was like God shining his beacon upon this guy. And, um, and from then on, he, we started going to church three times on a Sunday, um, started getting fellowship. He, he'd come round to my flat and pray with me and, and, and the Holy Spirit would touch me and he'd, he'd often pray for me and I'd fall asleep, but it was almost like God was doing, uh, I'd fall asleep and God would do little surgeries on me, mm. little bits of healing, little bits of um, restoration. So was, was the healing that you're, you're talking about there, was that always God's, I mean, did, did you, were you by this time off your medication? Uh, what, what, how, how did that happen? Yeah, well, I got saved in, um, in the October, the following November, I was baptised, uh, and by then I was speaking in tongues, but mm -hmm. my head was still all over. Um, and, and when I got baptised, it was an amazing experience. I just felt complete um, blown away by the power and the infilling of God. But it was about, it was about um, six months after I got baptised, we went to a conference that was, um, it was called Freedom from Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't aware of any kind of Freemason um, things in my family or anything like that. And I wasn't even, didn't even know what I was, what I was getting into. But we went to this, um, this conference and uh, it was all about um, um, curses and stuff like that and demonic bondage and, and how the enemy gets into our lives. And, and during that, um, it, during the preaching, I felt myself um, in uncontrollably, involuntary, manifesting. I couldn't, my face started making like, mm -hmm. like evil faces and I couldn't control it and, and I felt really uncomfortable. I felt like I wanted to get out of there. And at the end of that, I got prayed for and they asked me to come back for a retreat, for a Christian retreat. So I, I, we, we, we went to that um, and during that, I got some deliverance and I got a lot of demons um, cast out of me. Um, and that was amazing. So do, do you see your schizophrenic tendencies totally as demonic or do you feel that they were causing it but anyway there there, there were some some mental things because of what had gone on in your life yeah. do, do you see it as a mixture of both now well i see it that that satan was able to twist me up mm. and mess me up mess my thought processes mess my perception of reality uh, and once the once the Lord had cast the demons out, it that it could begin to to take go back into its natural shape. Right. God was right. able to begin to restore me. Had to get the bad guys out first, yeah. and then He was able to begin. And even that was a process of, yes. of restoration. Yes. There's the deliverance, but then the restoration comes afterwards. I think that's and an that important point. Well. I, I would just like to, and, and, and for you to underline again, with, yeah. with, because I think again, uh, I mean, we're talking about the quick fix. Some people say, oh, I've got the demon of this and demon of that, and whether yeah. they have or they haven't, if they have and it's cast out, they think, oh, that's it, fine. But you have to walk with God, even after that, don't you? Yeah, after absolutely. that cleansing, after that deliverance, you still have to walk with God to be filled yeah. with him. I, yeah. w was that something you had to learn at that time? I think that um, from, from the time when I got saved, God made such a massive impact in my life that I only wanted to live for him. Mm. I mean, I, I, all I wanted was to, to know God more. To, um, so the the, 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 the I, the reality that God came into my life and then I knew God was there. I didn't have to search anymore. So for me, it was very exciting to think that I can have a destiny, I can have a future, I can Amen. have a life Amen. that's already planned out. Um, of course you've got to walk with God. Mm -hmm. Of course you've got to, to, to walk with God. It's like we're like children. We're like five-year-olds and he's the daddy. And if we think we can do anything by ourselves, then, then we're wrong. And no matter... No matter where we are, we, we, we need to constantly look to him. 
Um, it's not, there's, no, there's no quick fix. I mean, God doesn't save us so that we can go, oh, I'm okay now, I'm going to wander off and do my own thing again. I mean, if people do do that, then it's a real shame because they're missing out on that relationship. I mean, the amount of joy that you can have from having a daily relationship with the Lord. You know, God, I don't believe God is going to give someone a calling in which they are independent of him. Mm, mm. You know, he's our father in heaven. And yeah, if anybody thinks that they want to get healed so that they can go on and do their own thing, then I think that there's something wrong in their heart. Mm. And I might sound judgmental, but I, I do. I think that, you know, whatever God does for us, that's it's, great. It's, but we need him. Amen. You know. We, we've come to the end of our time, Andrew, pretty well. But I, I think that's the message, isn't it? To leave, let God do in you what he needs to do in you and Amen. then serve him and live for him. Yeah. You're doing that, Andrew. Bless you. May you carry on doing that. If, if anything in this ha story has touched you, ensure you seek God and find that deliverance and truth for yourself. Bye for now.